Today, we're going to talk about Noble, the S&P 500 Dividend Aristocrats ETF. The reason that we're covering this is because we're on a quest to find the best dividend ETF. And throughout that quest, we're going to be emphasizing the importance of track records and dividend growth. And at least as it pertains to track records, Noble is in a class of its own. So they're the only dividend aristocrats ETF out there. That means the companies contained within have not only paid a dividend, but increased it for at least 25 years in a row. Now, the big question we're going to try to answer today is noble worth the cost. So let's start by looking at the 10 largest dividend ETFs. And we've already done some past videos. And in one of those, we eliminated the Vanguard Dividend Appreciation ETF. And we highlighted the Schwab US Dividend Equity ETF as being one of particular interest. Now, you'll notice here in this ranking, the size is reflected there in the center, total assets. And larger ETFs are always better because they can afford to have very low expense ratios. Those are the fees that you pay the managers of those ETFs. So here are several past videos that we've done on this topic. The first relating to SCHD. Uh, frankly, it looks pretty solid. Uh, ignore the year-to-date performance questions. I mean, that time frame is just too small to even be considered. Dividend growth matters, and that's something that we talked about in that presentation. We then went on to look at SCHD versus VIG. VIG's methodology wasn't overly compelling, to be honest. They have a fairly low yield, though what's important is how fast that yield is growing. Well, their dividend growth is slower than SCHD. So um, the problem here with fixed income, you hear uh, financial advisors always talk about, you know, equities and fixed income. And when you get Social Security in the United States, that's something that um, older people get when they retire. Uh, it's fixed, which means that as time goes on, you're getting less and less money because of inflation. There's some metric that says in 30 years, your purchasing power halves. Well, who wants that to happen? You don't want to be getting older and having your quality of life decrease as time goes on. So it's very important to pay attention to that. Now, when we look at ETFs, and we touched on this before, we're going to emphasize it more today. This study by Morningstar, it's not just one. There's a dozen studies out there that show this. The expense ratio, those are the fees that you're paying. The most proven predictor of future fund returns is the expense ratio. And that just makes sense, right? Because those fees add up over time. And this gentleman in this article, this is from Morningstar, he says, that's also what academics, fund companies, and of course, Jack Bogle find when they run the data. Indeed, Bogle was the founder and chief executive of the Vanguard Group and is credited with popularizing the index fund. He brought us ETFs, right? They're a low cost way to invest money before you would have had to use mutual funds that charged a lot of money. So two important factors, very important, income growth. Now, as we said, the problem with fixed income is that it's fixed. So you're looking for that yield to grow over time. So the amount of money that the ETF is giving you should be increasing every year. Uh, fees, funds with lower costs outperform funds with higher costs in all categories, whether it's equities, bonds, any, any sort of fund the uh, funds with the lower fees outperform. 100% of the time, expense ratios and fees predict which funds will outperform. And uh, as Morningstar says, the expense ratio is the most proven predictor of future fund returns. So we better damn well be paying attention to it. And I wanted to quickly give a shout out to our amazing team here at Nanalyze. You can see them all here. Uh, these people are what make this channel possible alongside our uh, stellar development team in Hungary, Dunn, who we outsource all our uh, development work to. And I just wanted to um, recognize these people because they're uh, what allow us to publish such quality videos. So when we look at the impact of fees over 24 years in the S&P 500, this is very interesting. So the gray line, which you can't really see because it's blurred with the blue line, shows the S&P 500 uh, from 1996 to the year 2020. And the dollar amounts you see there reflect the appreciation of a million dollars. Now, look at the number there at the top, $9,794,000. Okay, that's the S&P return. So if you invested in the S&P without fees, that's what you have gotten. If somebody charged you 0.05%, what they call five basis points, 
you would have then received $9,672,000. So that's not quite a rounding error, but that seems to be a, a fair amount for fees. But look what happens when they charge you 1%. You lose like se over several million dollars. So it's very important to pay attention to fees. And I just wanted to quickly mention basis points. You know, finance people like to talk about these. And maybe it sounds a little cryptic. They'll refer to them as BIPs. But it's quite simple. So 1% is 100 basis points. And, you know, 0.01%, that's one basis point. So when we look at fees for the top, dividend ETFs. Look, we have the ones there at the top, six basis points, six basis points, six basis points, eight. Okay, six and eight. Well, you know, that's, that's still fine. But look at the drop off there. So the next dividend ETF, 35 basis points. So you're paying, what, three to five times, over five times as much in fees. Is it really worth it? And that's the question with Noble. You see Noble, ProShares, S&P 500, Dividend Aristocrats ETF, charging 35 basis points. So when we look at why they, sh they say you should invest in Noble, it's the only ETF focusing exclusively on the S&P 500 Dividend Aristocrats. So again, companies that haven't just paid dividends for 25 years in a row, but increased them with the most of them doing that for 40 years or more. That's an amazing track record. And you can bet they're going to try to keep that track record. So these household names, a lot of them, have stable earnings, solid fundamentals, and strong histories of profit and growth. This strategy has a demonstrated history of weathering market turbulence over time by capturing most of the gains of rising markets and fewer of the losses in falling markets. So that's lower volatility. It also reflects the sharp ratio, which is the amount of gain that you're getting for the amount of risk that you're taking. So this is important to note. Always distinguish between the performance of an ETF that charges fees and the performance of the underlying index that doesn't charge fees. Because just because the index outperforms doesn't mean the ETF will. The problem with this Noble ETF is that it lacks performance numbers prior to 2013. So that means we have about 10 years of data. Now look, in this table, they show us Noble's market price NAV against that NAV stands for net asset value against the underlying index and what it's off by 42 basis points. Well, we know 35 of those are fees. The rest is what's called tracking error because they're trying to track that index and give you that performance. But what's missing in this table is an external benchmark. So remember, we only have 10 years of data. And when you look at the 10 years of data for Noble, it actually underperforms the S&P 500. We're going to talk about that in a second. But when you look at that index, that strategy from 2005 to 2023, so a lot more data there, you can see that in the top chart. These index returns, of course, don't reflect any management fees, transaction costs, or expenses, but it handily outperforms the S&P 500. And that makes sense based on some academic research we've done ourselves around this particular theme. So you can see there in the, in the below tables, the dividend aristocrats have grown their dividends faster. So an annualized growth rate of over 8% versus 6.7%. And it says here, the dividend aristocrats index has outperformed the S&P 500 during eight of the 10 worst quarterly drawdowns since 2005. Again, going back to that idea of this being um, an ETF that's very attractive to risk averse investors such as ourselves. And you can see here, the increase, this idea of yield on cost, that's the yield you're getting on the money that you originally put. The table on the lower right there shows how the yield on cost grows a lot faster for S&P 500 dividend aristocrats than the S&P 500 itself. Speaking of growth, let's talk about dividend growth. And I've taken three ETFs. So VIG, the one that we dismissed, SCHD, the one we like, and Noble. And we're simply looking at the historical data that's available, which is their payouts over, say, since 2013. And you can see we've annualized that. So for SCHD, SCHD it's actually quite impressive, frankly, a 10% growth every year. It works out to that right. But look at Noble, and this is odd. I was not expecting to see this. You see years where there's actually a decrease. You can say, well, how can that be if the constituents are always raising their dividends? Well, two reasons, really. It's uh, timing of when they have their distributions, and also that the mechanics of that underlying index, we need to look closer at to understand that because they do reweightings. So 
you see Noble actually has a growth rate of 9%. And, you know, this isn't even a decade worth of data, but uh, that's still interesting to note. And the question you can ask yourself here as well, look at the yields. So you have SCHD yielding 3.85%, Noble 4.29%. How long would it take SCHD at that slightly higher growth rate to have, their, have your yield on costs go over the yield that Noble is paying? So that'd be an interesting thing to take a look at. But uh, when we look at fund performance and index history, so remember we talked about since fund inception, whether or not S&P 500 dividend aristocrats index has beaten the S&P 500. You can see here it hasn't. So look at this table, the numbers in the lower right, those two. So the aristocrats index 10.95%, the S&P 500 12.10%. But what we're missing here, and I took this from their fact sheet, is we need to consider different types of return, three types really, asset appreciation, which is what I suspect this is, then that plus cash payments, and the next step, and the one that I think uh, investors who are dollar cost averaging and reinvesting dividends, you know, real investors looking to grow wealth are going to want to pay attention to, that's when you take the distributions and you immediately buy more shares of the underlying ETF. That's called gross total return. So you'd want to examine those. But to be honest, we don't spend a lot of time using past performance to make present day decisions. We're more interested in analyzing the mechanics of the index because that's what makes sense. Here you can see the holdings with the longest records of dividend growth, and we cover this in our own strategy, how impressive it is for a company to have increased their dividend for 60 years in a row. Wow, what a track record, right? And then when you look here at the index highlights, so they talk here about an equal weighted methodology, that's fine. But then they say rebalanced quarterly to equal weights. So that's a lot of work going on there. And if you were going to try to replicate this, it could be quite complicated. What might be better to use here, and it's what we do, is a trimming approach where we simply let those winners run for a while. And as soon as they start to get too big of a percentage of the portfolio, we then trim them back and take those proceeds and use them to add into companies that are underweighted, right? So it sort of balances itself out. So the question here you're all wanting us to answer is Noble a buy? Well, is the S&P 500 a buy? If you can answer either or either of those questions, then we'd be really impressed because that's uh, that shows that you have some ability to forecast what the markets are going to do. Don't try to time the market. So 95% of active managers can't manage to do that. And they're professionals who do that for a living. Most people are not lump sum investing and deciding whether or not to sink a large percentage of their wealth into this ETF. Most people are dollar cost averaging into quality assets. In that case, it's always time to buy Noble if you find it to be a compelling ETF. Just remember you're paying 5.8 to 4.4 times more in fees for Noble compared to those lower cost, cost alternatives we pointed out. And then, you know, if you're going to try to avoid those fees and replicate this, it's you know, buying 67 names isn't realistic, but perhaps 20 to 30 are. And that's where we have our own noble alternative. And it's our dividend growth investing strategy, Quantigen. So we developed this uh, myself and uh, some esteemed colleagues over a decade. Uh, you can build your own dividend portfolio, choosing from only the best names. We have about around 80 stocks in the universe and 10 of these names we consider the best. Uh, and we're holding 30 of them in our own model portfolio. Here you can see a calculator we built and the factors we use. So we take into consideration the years increasing dividend, international sales, market cap, five-year dividend growth, 10-year dividend growth, yield, and payout ratio to come up with what's called a Q score. And what's interesting to look at here is when you see Noble there on the left, they have 67 companies in their portfolio, Dividend yield, 2.55%, average market cap of 84. Well, we can look at our universe and see something very similar. So we have, uh, remember they talked about a 40-year average? Well, we have close to 43-year average of increasing. You see market cap, uh, pretty close there. And then, of course, our portfolio average across the top, just to show our devia deviation away from the universe. And you can see yield. Uh, it r yields roughly the same. It's quite interesting to see that, right? So... Um, just when you're looking at ETFs, 
beware of the unknown unknowns. And I kind of like this cartoon on the right because it's like an investor sort of probing, you know, the what's on the tin of the ETF when the big dragon of fees is about to eat them. Um, understand the mechanisms of an ETF to know what you're getting into. To do that, you've got to understand the index. And two things we're focused on as we continue our journey to find the best dividend ETF would be a focus on low fees and income stream growth. So the big question here is the 35 basis points fee for Noble worth it? No, hard to say. We're, we don't think it is. Uh, remember, you can always create your own dividend growth portfolio. So for future videos, we're going to take a look at some of the other names in that list, in particular, uh, the, some of the lower cost names, such as the uh, Vanguard High Dividend Yield Index ETF and the iShares core dividend growth ETF. So those are two are next uh, on our list. Of, we'll put some videos out on those. But in the meantime, you can watch this piece we did, our take on SCHD. It's rather informative. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this today.